Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to AIEC Webinar Weeks. This is uh, episode 29. Uh, we are in our uh, last round of series two. We've got uh, uh, this, uh, this webinar that you're attending now, and we've got three more webinars throughout today. So we hope that um, we we'll hope you stick around and, and uh, enjoy some of those uh, upcoming webinars. Um, this webinar, uh, as usual, will last about an hour. We'll leave 10 or 15 minutes towards the end for Q&A. If you would, please, uh, we ask that you submit your questions through the chat function in uh, Zoom. Uh, please utilize the little drop-down menu, select AIEC, direct those questions to Brian and myself, and uh, we will moderate those questions to our presenters. Um, real quick reminder, um, hopefully tomorrow you should be receiving an uh, email from Ashley Graham. Ashley's going to be sending out a survey for our webinar weeks. Um, you know, if you've enjoyed this, we'd, we'd love to get some feedback from you. Um, always uh, welcome some, some constructive criticism as well. We want to make these as enjoyable and as informative to you as we can. Uh, so please fill out that survey. Um, if, uh, if we receive a completed survey from you, that'll get you entered into a drawing for our grand prize giveaway that we'll, um, we'll give away at the start of our first uh, webinar in series three, um, which uh, the date for that's to be determined, but uh, currently we're thinking um, we'll start that webinar series sometime in um, March. Is that correct, Brian? Yeah. I think I think we're thinking the beginning of March, so uh, stay tuned for that. I uh, also want to give a quick plug um, for our CTC conference. Uh, due to COVID, uh, as most of you know, we weren't able to, to host that uh, in 2020. Um, currently, we are looking uh, to host in person our 2021 CTC conference on October 13th through 15th in Bloomington Normal. So uh, as of right now, we're, we're kind of moving full steam ahead with that. Um, gonna kick things off and, and get moving. So um, hopefully by then, you know, we'll, we'll have a vaccination and um, things will be opening up a little bit and we can all look forward to, to getting back together. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Brian. All right, uh, one quick reminder, uh, this uh, webinar does qualify for PDHs. So if you're a PE, um, make sure you stay on the call and, and I'll uh, get you those hopefully sent out later this week. Um, it'll be all the PDHs for this the series two uh, webinar. So um, let me know if for some reason I've, I've missed one. I'm, I'm trying to keep as good a track as I can with the registrations and the um, Zoom attendance. So. Um, watch for those later this week, hopefully. Um, our presenters today are Laura Abelmuna and Anthony Hale. Uh, Laura is a product manager at Copperwell working on new product development and marketing strategy for the Power Grid division. Laura has been in the electrical industry for 10 years now, holding various roles in multiple market segments in sales, strategic project management and design, and co-founder of a startup venture while at Schneider Electric. Laura received her Bachelor of Engineering degree from Vanderbilt University. Our other presenter, Anthony, is a 40-year professional in manufacturing and sales. Anthony holds a bachelor's degree in production and operation management and MBA from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Having worked in manufacturing for an aerospace and defense contractor as well as the last 20 years with Copper Weld in telecommunications, automotive, specialty wiring, and grounding. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Laura. Thank you all. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Laura Abelmuna. I'm the Associate Product Manager at Copper Wells. I wanted to thank the team at I AIEC for continuing with these webinar series. I think that's the norm these days. So appreciate that. And um, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, Anthony, briefly. Good morning, everybody. It's an honor to be with you. I really appreciate it. Um, as he said, uh, I've been with Copper Weld now. It'll be this spring will be 21 years. Uh, Illinois is, is uh, part of my territory as far as what I manage there for the uh, utility side. And uh, yeah, looking forward to this. Thank you very much. So the topic I'd like to discuss today is to review the analysis we conducted on the market variability trends of copper grounding products. 
Just to go through a little bit of our agenda, we're going to talk about what the problem is, what the application we, we have, and then um, a little bit about us. So you may wonder why this topic is relevant or even a matter of discussion. But the first question arose while we began verification testing on our copper weld Sentry CCS grounding wire. We realized we needed to compare our test results against the baseline or control variable. In this case, it was copper. What we began to find was that copper did not meet the IEEE standard 80 maximum current specified in table six. So we decided to examine how copper's physical characteristics possibly affected performance. To elaborate a bit more on our previous study, we presented a paper and our findings at the CDEX users group meeting last year. Um, titled Short Circuit Performance Considerations for CCS. Jeff Jordan, who is my colleague, published his findings. At CDEX, we discussed a more fundamental problem, which is the performance that we never published in the 1960s, the 70s, and 80s that we achieved in a test lab and some new test data that we've continued today. And we looked at how those different results measure up against the standard 80 calculations that are used to determine substation applications in the grid. You'll see 19 number nine is the product we sell today into the 4 op market. You'll notice that shot 1-1 and 2-1 are actually the same sh sample shot twice. We shot it at 33.5 Ka for a duration of 500 milliseconds. That is the fusing limit in the IEEE calculations. So we decided to go further and test it at 36.2 Ka. And again, it didn't fuse. We used PowerTech Labs for this study. Again, this is for going through um, verification testing for our products for Copperweld. And we came across these findings. And of course, there's always going to be error in the in the lab, um, and no one can get that precise. So again, later in my discussion, um, you know, you'll notice that I cannot give any further data than the closest, you know, thousand ka when we're referencing um, a lot of this information. So the issue is that our performance seems to exceed, even outperform the IEEE calculations. The results suggest that the IEEE standard 80 method for determining the ultimate current carrying capacity of CCS does not accurately predict its performance. So what did that mean for copper? At the request of CDEGS and the community, we needed a foundation for our results. So as a result, we continued to examine CCS while baselining against copper for um, every test conducted. We noted some differences for copper from the, I, the published IEEE uh, values. For simplicity, this led me to the question, how does copper's physical characteristics impact its performance? So for the purpose of the study that I'm talking about today, we collected samples from various distributors throughout the country from coast to coast to get a good variety. The goal was to diversify the type of manufacturers in our sample set. We also wanted to have overlaps in this of the same manufacturer type to examine like multiple reels within the same set. So same, same size, same manufacturer, different size, different manufacturer, um, just to diversify it. In no specific order, I came upon CME nearing Southwire, Republic, Cero, and Encore, which are all leading copper manufacturers. For the purpose of our study, the brands were coded only to help identify patterns. The samples collected varied in stranding type, but we targeted sizes 4 aught, 2 aught, number 4, and number 6 in order to gather insight on two differing applications. In this case, it was substation grounding and pole grounding. 
again, we needed a guideline to measure our results again. So we focused on these standards, IEEE standard 80, which references safety and substation grounding with expected short circuit rating for copper wire. ASTM V3, which focuses on annealed solid copper wire and its properties for manufacturing standards. And then both ASTM V8 and ASTM V787 focus on stranded copper wire. One is con concentric and the other is um, 19 stranded genolay. However, both these standards use the same table uh, for reference. To conduct our analysis, we cut samples to approximately two foot lengths using a laser micrometer. The diameter of the overall strand was measured as well as the individual strands, which were taken apart and also measured. We also measured resistance using a resistance bridge and brake load of each strand using the Tanias Olsen testing machine. From there, we extrapolated data to calculate the cross-sectional area, the tensile strength, and the short circuit performance. These images were taken directly from our test lab for reference. So I want to begin with some of the larger sizes that we sampled, in this case apl applicable to substation grounding. The results for the four of for our substation grounding application are shown. To quickly walk you through our table, each sample was numbered and sorted by the brands. Again, as you see, brands were coded so as not to bias the results, nor did we find that it should impact our results. Depending on the brand availability determined the luck of the draw for how many samples of each we were able to collect. Here you see four different brands labeled um, a through D, and you can see on the left-hand side of that, that A, we have three samples, B, we have three samples, but then C and D may be um, one or two samples of each. This allowed us to just see the variability and consistency. Of course, I'd like to expand my sample set, but essentially, you know, I had limited availability. The next column shows the various stranding, in this case, 19 and seven strand. Then we have the overall diameter based on our measurements. We used the data collected to calculate the cross-sectional area and the short circuit rating. The break load of each individual strand was measured and the total was summed. What we see here on the far right is that IEEE standard 80 using table six shows a short circuit rating of 44,000 amps, or as we like to say, 44 kA for four aught copper wire. The simplified formula from standard 80 was used then to calculate the expected short circuit from the data we extrapolated. When you look at the position of the, the precision of the data shown in two significant figures. In reality, we cannot get that type of accuracy in the test lab. So we've highlighted that in Jeff's previous study that I mentioned um, that we presented at CDEX users group. We know that the lab has an uncertainty of plus or minus 2%. That doesn't take into account the variability of the copper, just the lab, the lab capabilities. So ideally, we would drop off the decimal points, but I've left them here for the depiction of the calculations because this is straight from IEEE. My calculations will remain with two decimal points for the remainder of this study, but really we would look at it as plus or minus 400 amps. Regardless, as you can see, none appear to match the expected 44KA short circuit expectation from table six. So from our samples, four out wire shows an up to 8% variability range from anticipated short circuit results. This is the exact same slide, but here now we are just looking at the cross-sectional area and the diameters. 
Now we examined another set of standards, ASTM B8 and ASTM B787. Both referenced again table one and required the cross-sectional area to be within 2%. So if you look at the highlighted table in yellow above, you see that the cross-sectional area needs to be between 211.6 and 207.4 kc mil. We found that four of those samples fell out of that range, which are circled in red. These are concerning to us because they are smaller than the lower range allows for, and yet we only did a small sampling. On the other hand, we had two samples that exceeded the upper limit. Now we examine the two odd application. Again, each sample was numbered and sorted by the associated brand. In this case, brands were limited. We only had three types to work with in this application. We depict on the far right the IEEE standard 80 table six, again showing 28 KA for two odd. The simplified formula from standard 80 was used to calculate the expected short circuit. As you can see, none appear to match the two out sampled set um, and shows an up to 8% variability range. And again, we examined ASTM B8 and ASTM B787 for cross-sectional area and reference table one. You can see the expected value within the highlighted region in the first table above from table one is 133.1 kc mil. Um, and the minimum value needed to be 130.4 kc mil, which is within 2% on the lower spectrum, um, which is 2% of what the lower spectrum allowed. For 2 watt, if you look at the table above, um, you can see that essentially a few samples fell out of that range again, circled in red. Um, and then the green, the lime green highlight that you see on the left where the strand count is shown, I have two samples, ironically enough, um, from two different manufacturers that had an 18 strand count. Um, it's interesting because, you know, these standards are for 19 strands. However, one actually still exceed, met the, the cross-sectional area requirement, whereas the other one didn't. So I'm not sure if this is a norm, um, but it looks like one of them still met the requirements uh, on one aspect, but still did not contain the 19 strands. So this one was odd, but it wasn't limited to just one manufacturer. So just wanted to point that out. So based on this limited study, what we found was that 40% of the samples tested out of spec for the substation grounding application in both 4 aught and 2 aught wire sizes. Two wire samples met or exceeded the upper limit and the remainder met the lower limit. None of the samples met the ultimate short circuit rating in IEEE standard 80 table six. So for four out sampling, we had a three to 8% variability range from the expected IEEE value in table six. For two out sampling, we had a four to 8% variability range. Similarly, in this case, we examined number four stranded and solid copper for pool grounding applications. Again, we use the simplified formula provided in IEEE standard 80 to calculate our short circuit rating based off of diameters and strands. We found that number four copper had up to 9% variability from the anticipated IEEE standard 80 table six. We examined the ASTM requirements again here in this case we used ASTM B8 for concentric lay stranded copper, similar to what we reviewed in 4 out and 2 out samples. But we also reviewed ASTM B3 for annealed solid copper for the single end options. We found that three of the number four samples did not meet the limit of 40.91 kc mil minimum range, which you can see it needed to be between 41.74 and 40.91. 
based on the standard requirement. And for ASTM B3, the standard requires the diameter to be plus or minus 1% of 0.204 inches, which you referenced from the AWG wire guide. And lastly, we examined number six wire gauge size for bolt pull grounding applications. What you can see here is that we actually had a larger sample size with five different differing brands. Again, we use the simplified formula provided in IEEE standard 80. We see that number six copper had up to 13% variability from the expected short circuit performance in table six. We then examined the ASTM requirements. In this case, we used ASTM B8 for a concentric lay and ASTM B3 for annealed solid copper for the single end options. For number six, we see that all the samples met ASTM for both B8 and B3. So in summary for this sample set, we found that 10% of the samples for pole grounding application tested out of spec. Approximately 70% of those samples met or exceeded the upper limit. However, none of these met the ultimate short circuit rating in IEEE standard 80 table six. We found that number four copper wire samples had a three to 9% variability range and number six copper wire had a 10 to 13% variability range. So we decided to take this a step further and take one of our sample subsets to review using a normal probability distribution curve. If we start with the normal probability distribution, ultimately, what would it signify? If you add up the four big gray regions, you get 95.4%. So in statistics, we can expect some distribution, but of course, some of that distribution may fall outside of the bell curve, but my expectation as I was doing this study is that a majority would fall within the gray region. So if the big, the four big chunks are 95%, then the two little bits are 5%. So we expect some to fall outside of that range, and by some, I mean 5% based on this normal distribution curve. The zero represents the average value in our case. This would be the nominal cross-sectional area provided by ASTM. Or for the single end strands, the value would signify the actual AWG gauge size. So most of the time, we should expect that, that the data will fall near the middle value and some of the time the data will fall outside of that expected middle value. So we took um, one of our sample sets, this case 4 aught, compared it against the normal probability distribution curve. And our sample set is depicted in the red dots. Again, zero represents, in this case, the average expected data point, which in our case would be the nominal value or the gauge size. For the cross-sectional area to be no less than 98% of the value in table one, we would expect the data to fall a no, follow a normal distribution curve. Therefore, our expectation is that all the red dots should fall more or less within the 95%. Statistically speaking, we should expect some of the um, to be on the outer edges. However, from the existing sample population illustrated in red, you can see that 40% of the data falls outside of the expected allowable range outlined in the AS. So again, if the four large regions are 95% of the expected data, then the other two portions are 5%. We did expect some to fall outside of the range, and by that, again, it was only meant to be 5%, not 40%. So this graph has been shifted to one standard deviation to the left. What we also see is that the IEEE table six value is three standard deviations away from our sample set. So there are two differing variabilities here when we look at this data sampling. Ultimately, I wish I had more data to show you all, but from the data points that I do have, 
um, you can see it's starting to trend into the shape of a bell curve. So what we concluded was, yes, there is variability in the market, in the copper grounding market. We show a variability of up to 13% from the IEEE short circuit standard, and approximately 25% of the samples did not meet the ASTM spec. However, what this study does tell us is that further sample and further study is needed. A larger sample size would be uh, with more experimental replications within each subset is needed in order to have more statistically significant data. But what we did find, you know, still does tell us a lot about what is in the market today. Anthony? Okay, very good. Um, did we want to, did anybody have any questions they want to talk about um, on the data Laura presented before I start on this piece? I guess there were none. Okay. Anthony, we have no questions at this time. Thank okay. You. Beautiful. All right. Um, really appreciate you guys uh, sticking around and, uh, and letting us present this to you. I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about some of the other options, right? Um, when you go to grounding and you got to make a decision on what you're going to put in, uh, what are some of these other options? And I'm obviously going to talk about copper weld um, and, and uh, just a little background on copper weld. We are the people that actually invented the copper clad steel product in 1915. So we've been making it this year be 106 years continuously uh, we are the only manufacturer of copper clad steel in the United States, the only one using U.S. steel, um, U.S. workers putting it together. So, uh, uh, you know, just make sure that what I'm going to say is, is applicable to copper weld, but I cannot, um, <laughs> obviously, it's not valid for stuff coming from offshore. Okay. Um, we, we've done a lot of different things over the years. Um, and what we call the traditional product sizes uh, century that we've made for over a hundred years, right? Makes sense. Uh, which followed the American wire gauge, which was, you know, you can make a six, a four, a two, you know, a, a 12, 11, 10, nine, eight, seven, you know, gauge wire. And then you can strand it up to whatever count you need uh, based on, on the application. Uh, so that's what we call the century products. And then there's a new product we're, we've just come out with, we are calling Archangel, all right? And, and it is not based on the American wire gauge, but rather the IEEE 80 table six that Laura mentioned earlier, right? So where the Century products just try to match the current copper that is out there, uh, four aught copper at 41 KA, the Archangel products match the performance of the IEEE 80 table six, right? So it gets 44 KA. So that's the difference between the two. Okay. All right, Laura. Next slide. Laura, oh, there we go. <laughs> um, uh, so when we say we've been selling, we sell the, this stuff all over the world. Um, it's all made in uh, Fayetteville, Tennessee. Uh, but we do serve the entire world out of that factory. We sell it in all these applications uh, from, from structure grounding uh, to obviously the substation grids, uh, both in transmission and distribution, the transmission grounds and trend, uh, distribution lines, all that grounding, everything uh, where you use a copper ground, there's a copper weld sized for, for the application. Okay, go ahead and let's move on to the next slide. All right, so when we talk about the, the, it's the IEEE 30. 80 table six, we're talking about that 44 KA that copper's supposed to hit, but it doesn't. And we talked about the, the Archangel is supposed to hit that 44. So we're gonna play this video. This is uh, an actual test. Um, to show you the difference, so they're both going to hit. So, so that's.
that's the real difference. And I promise you, we did not doctor the sound. That is the actual sound uh, off the microphone on the camera um, when the copper fused, because it's the heat is what it, you know evaporates the the copper. Uh, and in the archangel carried the the current. Now, not only did it carry it once, but we took the same one and hit it again, and it carried it for a second full 44 ka at half uh, at 30 cycles, half a second. Right, so when we talk about what we're trying to do, that's this is the kind of testing that we do on the Copperwell product. So you have to know what we're we're offering. All right. Okay. So what we've done is is list all the different options based uh, on on the fault currents you need in a what we call a selection guide, and we base that off of the copper size. So this particular one is called the four ot selection guide. So if we're using a 4 out copper, you can see down there at the bottom with 4 out copper, you're getting, you know, the 41 KA. And what we offer is the, the like the 19 number nine, the highlighted uh, row that gives you the same 41 KA, right? And, and that is, we've been selling that uh, into substation grids for, you know, nearly a hundred years now. Um, and it is, it is very, very popular for that. Um, but there are other options, right? There are, there's a seven strand, a seven number five, which gives you the 38 KA. We also make uh, an exact four aught size, uh, 19 strand. Uh, so it fits the same four aught connectors and it will give you 35 KA again at, at 30 cycles. So depending on where you really need to be uh, with your um, fault currents, what, what available fault current is there, there are options uh, the trade off cost and flexibility and, and the fault current levels, but they all are based on the copper weld product, right? Which we've tested and, and we can stand behind these numbers. Okay, let's look at one more. I think, yeah, we did the uh, number six um, on the distribution side, especially for rural co ops. Uh, this is probably the, the number one seller uh, is just go size for size with the number six. Obviously, it's all listed and approved by RUS. Um, but you can see with the number six copper, you're getting 5KA uh, at the, the data that, that Laura presented earlier validated. And um, we go, uh, we have the same number six, which will give you 4KA. So size for size, it's a little bit lower with the copper weld. Uh, we have a stranded product, the seven by 068, which will give you the exact same 5KA. And it's actually more flexible than the number six solid copper, right? So it's, it's a really, really nice product. Uh, and obviously you can go up to the, the number four solid, which in years past that has been typically, if you have some higher line faults and you need at least the 5KA, you can go up size to the number four and that'll give you seven, okay? All those are available on the same 25 pound spools. Um, ours are green, so you know both in the warehouse and on the truck which one's the copper weld, right? So you don't get them mixed up with copper because they are gonna look like copper. Okay. All right, um, connectors, The again, because the, the copper weld is made with oxygen-free copper. So right out of the gate, we have a better grade of copper than the ETP grade that you buy when you get solid copper. Um, that is compatible with all these connectors, all your standard connectors that you're already using works perfectly fine with the copper weld, whether it's exothermic or it's crimp or swedge, it, it, it works perfectly fine. Uh, we work with all these manufacturers and, and you know every time they come out with a, a new connector that we'll send them more wire and they'll do their testing. Um, but uh, especially like on crimp connectors, the copper weld actually outperforms copper because the steel, you get good deformation right inside the crimp uh, because it is a low carbon and it's annealed, uh, but the steel holds its bite. So as you thermal cycle over time, it doesn't loosen up in the connector like copper because copper's softer, right? It wants to creep and flow and, and you don't have any of those issues with the copper weld, okay? All right. So that I didn't have time to go through all the different sizes. Um, but we certainly uh, are available. And I have these selection guides all the way from a number six to a 500 MCM. 
Um, the Archangel product is available in to replace a two aught, the four aught, the 350, and the 500 MCM. Uh, those are all, uh, except for the two aught, is a 61 in strand. Um, so now you know you can have a 500 MCM replacement that you can bend over your knee. That it's a really amazing how flexible those are. So I wanted to give you a, a flavor for the different types of uh, products that are available, the options out there. Um, obviously, with the copper weld, it's it's nobody wants to steal the stuff because it's because once we put the metal together, the value of the copper is completely gone. Right, so it's virtually worthless to a thief if they do take it to the scrap yard. Obviously, it's magnetic with that steel core, so they can tell. Uh, we have other options uh, called hide or camo where we can disguise the wire so it doesn't look like copper. Um, so there, there's a lot of things going on. We're, we're happy to talk to you about those. Uh, Evans, Lipka and Associates is our manufacturer's rep for Illinois, Wisconsin, Missouri, uh, the Dakotas, Minnesota, Kansas, Iowa, and Nebraska. I believe I got all those in there. So, you know, you, you're welcome to contact Laura or I, and, and we'll make sure we get in touch with uh, the Evans Lipka salespeople and, and give you any information that you need. Okay. So, I guess we're ready for questions. Thanks, Anthony. We do have a couple questions. Um, I think this first one is probably for Laura. Uh, did you find that your sample set was diverse enough? I had to unmute myself for a second. Um, I felt that the sample set was diverse. It was a matter of how many samples within each um, type that I would have liked to get more of. Um, and essentially, you know, with the limited samples that we did get, it was varying information already from just those initial sample sets. I just, from the trend, you can see that it was shaping into a bell curve. So essentially, based off of the information that we did gather, it probably would have fallen in line with the samples that I did gather. Thanks, Laura. One other question came in, um, and this, I don't know if this one's for you or Anthony. Um, what products would you guys recommend? I, I, it depends what your available fault current is in the application. Um, in substation, the uh, uh, obviously the the nineteen number nine has been used, you know, for decades uh, in in substation grids as well as the down leads. Um, I have customers that use the bare below grade and then they use like the camo above grade. Uh, so that anything that's coming up above grade doesn't look like copper. Um, and you wind up with a very robust and secure grid, but nobody wants to steal it. It doesn't break, it doesn't fatigue like copper does. Again, because, because of that steel core, we, we pick up all those benefits uh, with the strength side of the steel. Uh, in the distribution side, it's the same thing. Um, it, it, you don't have the fatigue, right? Wind fatigue. Um, somebody backs their truck into the pole, right? It doesn't cut the copper weld like it does copper. Uh, and, um, you know, the, it's, if you don't have the right tools, you know, that we're talking about the, the thieves that, that want to stand in the back of their pickup truck and they just whack at your pole grounds or fence grounds, um, and, and with the copper weld, they don't have the right tool. It, it uh, will bounce off, it really will. It's, it's amazing. I've got other videos we can show you um, uh, with that. And uh, so it, it really depends on what, what your applicable fault current is and where you're using it, right? We've got, again, a size and a flexibility based on wherever you wanna go. Um, we've got uh, some two watt sizes that uh, I actually developed with uh, a solar company out in Phoenix that turns out to be a phenomenal little fence ground, I mean, uh, equipment ground uh, for utilities. So it'll carry 23 KA, it's a 19 strand, it's a beautiful little strand, easy to work with. Um, so th there's, it just depends on what the application is, but we've got a size for everything. Thank you for that, Anthony. Uh, that's all the questions we have for today. We wanna to thank um, you, Anthony, both you and Laura for um, 
delivering your presentation to us today is very informative. I think our, uh, our participants um, enjoyed that. So um, thank you. And uh, it looks like you've got your contact information up there. Please feel free to reach out to or Anthony if you have any questions. Uh, as always, you can reach out to uh, myself, Brian, or Ashley, and we can get you in contact with them as well. Coming up next uh, will be series 30 in, or I'm sorry, episode 30 in uh, our second series. Um, that will be uh, from Siemens uh, on cybersecurity for OT, defense in depth. So looking forward to that. Uh, please stick around. Um, we hope to see you back. And that concludes our webinar, uh, episode 29. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.